episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the, the honor of being joined by none other than Dr. Judith Campisi, biochemist, cellular biologist, and professor of biogerontology at the Buck Institute uh, for Research on Aging. Uh, Dr. Campisi received her PhD in biochemistry uh, from State University of New York at Stony Brook. She completed her postdoc training in cell cycle regulation, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, uh, and is assistant uh, and associate professor at Boston University Medical School. Uh, she originally studied the role of cellular senescence in suppressing cancer, uh, soon became very convinced that these cells were uh, not just important in cancer, but also contributed significantly to aging uh, and joined uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories uh, back in 1991, uh, working with uh, Dr. Mina Bissell at the time. Uh, in 2002, she started a second lab at the Buck Institute. Uh, and at both institutes, uh, Dr. Campisi has established a broad program to understand the relationship between aging and age-related disease with an emphasis on uh, the interface between cancer and aging. Uh, Dr. Campisi is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and she has received numerous awards over the years for her research, including two merit awards from the National Institute on Aging, uh, an award from Allied Signal Corporation, the Gerontological Society of America, and the American Federation for Aging Research. Uh, she's a recipient of the Longevity Prize from the Ibsen Foundation, the Bennett Cohen Award from the University of Michigan, and the Schober Award for, uh, from Howe University, and is the first recipient of the International Olaf Kahn Foundation Prize in Natural Sciences and Medicine. Uh, Dr. Campisi currently serves on advisory committees for the Alliance for Aging Research, the Progeria Research Foundation, and the National Institute of Aging's uh, Intervention Testing Program. She's also an editorial board member for more than a dozen peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she's a scientific founder of Unity Biotech, a uh, California-based company focusing on developing uh, senolytic therapies for age-related pathologies, and she has served on the scientific advisory boards of the Giron Corporation, Sierra Biosciences, and Gamble Biosciences. Uh, a lot to talk about today, but Dr. Judith Campisi, uh, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to share whatever I can with you. I, I'm really looking forward to this. And, you know, I, I would love to start off um, just with a little uh, senescence history because um, a couple months ago, I don't know if you saw the episode, but I, I had Len Hayflick on, on our show and he took us up uh, into the mid 1960s, where he first talks about and defines, as, as you put it in, in, in your materials, this evolutionary selected stress response and state of cells, or they enter uh, proliferation cessation, known as cellular senescence. Uh, you start publishing uh, about this in the mid 1980s, but it's not until uh, early 1990s when when you team up with Mina Bissell uh, at Lawrence Berkeley that you start to make the the very important connections between uh, too much cellular proliferation in cancer and not enough in terms of senescence. Talk a little bit for if you would about these early days uh, of, of looking at what was going on here, if you would. Yeah, let, let me say something about Len Hayflick, because I don't, I don't even know if he completely understands this, but, you know, the whole idea of a cell dividing a certain number of times and then stopping flew in the face of what was then a dogma that was promulgated by a brilliant transplantation surgeon named Alexis Carell. This was 1910. Yep. And, you know, Alexis Carell, he really was, he, he, he discovered how to transplant hearts from one patient to another. I mean, it was, it was brilliant. And he won the Nobel Prize. Carell won the Nobel Prize for this work. But he also, Carell also puttered around in the lab and he would um, be studying cells and culture. He was using chick embryo cells. Mm -hmm. And he came to the conclusion, if you think about this, this is really a little bit crazy, but he came to the conclusion that these chick embryo cells divided indefinitely in culture mm -hmm. and concluded that immortality was 
um, a feature of individual cells and multicellularity was what conferred mortality. And therefore, if we understood how cells divided in culture, we would have the secret to immortality. Now, this is crazy, right? I mean, if you took hydrochloric acid and poured it on those chick cells, they would die. You know, he was confusing uh, division potential with immortality. And uh, this is not to take away from his brilliant work as a, as a surgeon, but it was kind of crazy. And then later it was found out that he was feeding these cultures of chick cells with mm -hmm. an extract that contained extra cells. So he was like always reseeding the, so anyway. And, and so when Hayflick was trying to grow viruses in human cells, and he couldn't because the cells would only divide a certain number of times and then they would just slow down and slow down and eventually stop. He was flying in the face of more than a couple of decades of, of standard scientific thought. And I think he's not given enough credit for having broken that paradigm. Now, Hayflick too, not everything in, in those classic papers was correct. For example, sure. he showed that senescent cells grew and then they, st the human cells, human cells grew and then they stopped and then he said they died. And that was, I think, because he was probably trying to pass it to them and they don't, mm -hmm. they don't attach to the, to the plate very well. So he thought they died and they don't die. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why there are 50 companies in the Bay Area now trying to work on drugs that kill senescent cells. They don't like to die. Mm -hmm. um, they do die, but they it, it's hard. But uh, I think he's often not given enough credit for how, how much he had to buck what was then scientific thought. So he made two connections. The first connection was absolutely correct because he was also growing cancer cells in his lab. And he was like, aha, cancer cells don't do this. Normal cells do this. This must be an anti-cancer mechanism. And I think decades of, of research by the cancer research community, which has always been somewhat ahead of the aging research community, um, has, has borne that out. It's definite, I think it's definitely clear that this mechanism of slowing down of proliferation is, is due to, to is due to an anti-cancer mechanism. His conclusion that it might have something to do with aging was la la land. I mean it was it was intuition. That's it. It was not based on any data. But there were other giants in the field, people like George Martin, people like Tuck Finch, um, who sort of took up this idea and began to think about it a little bit more deeply. And they were the ones who eventually, I think, convinced the community that this might have something to do with aging. And of course, in both cases, they were right. This is an anti-cancer mechanism and it almost certainly has something to do with aging, not lifespan, but aging. Sure. And, and that's the big distinction is understanding the distinction between aging and lifespan. And, and you know, along that continuum, if we, if we look at uh, on one end, cancer or uncontrolled proliferation, um, on the other end, senescence, uh, and in between sort of, you know, you've pointed out in, in past presentations that um, senescence throughout life, at different parts, um, it does some very important things for us. As, as fetuses developing, you know, we, we would not have any form uh, in our mother's wombs if it wasn't for senescent biology. Uh, we have very important tissue repair components of senescence, regenerative components of senescence. Um, talk a little bit, because I, I think this, this whole part I, I gets, and we'll get into sort of the uniqueness of, of the SASP and, and, and things that we're, you're studying now in terms of what's secreted, what's good, what's not. But talk a little bit also about sort of the, um, the good and the bad, along with the bad uh, that goes along with senescence, that we, we need some of it, 
but not yeah. too much of it. Yeah, I guess the important thing is to remember that for, you know, 90 plus percent of our, meaning Homo sapiens, our mm -hmm. species um, existence on the planet, um, there was no aging. Yeah. I, there was no Alzheimer's, no cancer. There was, you know, no macular degeneration. Why? Everyone was dead. Yeah. The lifespan was very short, and it was short due to external hazards. So predation, infection, um, starvation, all these things really kept human lifespan quite short. So what that meant was that during the evolution of genes that were designed to optimize the species, um, Evolution didn't care about whether we were old or young. What evolution cared about was how to keep you healthy so you can have your babies. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what evolution cares about, right? So, so preventing cancer in young people, very important. You don't want young people dying at age 25 or 30. Even if they're going to be dead by 40, doesn't matter. You want them to have their babies. And I will point out that in the, in the 1970s, I think it was Doug Brash who first showed that what we call oncogenes, activated oncogenes. So everyone's heard about the RAS oncogene, one of the first oncogenes to be discovered. You find that oncogene in very young tissue. So he, he did little skin biopsies from young and old people and showed that even at very young age, those oncogenes were present. So evolution had to solve the cancer problem from the get-go. And it gave us these tumor suppressor mechanisms, one of which is cellular senescence. So cellular senescence has been under evolutionary pressure from the beginning. And now we know that there's waves of senescence that help fine tune certain structures in the embryo. We know that there's waves of senescence in the placenta mm -hmm. that trigger labor. Um, and that's true in both mice and humans. So this whole idea that we have this cellular response that drives aging is really a byproduct. It's beyond the force of natural selection. And that's what we're stuck with now as people who are, have managed, we've mostly managed um, to solve most of the things that would kill us. So at least in the developed world, you know, we're no longer too worried about starvation. Predation, as far as I can see, our biggest predators are ourselves. Um, as far as uh, infection goes, well, the pandemic, even so, if you think about what um, things like the bubonic plague did centuries ago, you know, we, we are, of course, suffering under this COVID-19 um, pandemic, but it's still taking a small portion of lives, human lives, compared to what used to be true in our evolutionary history. So we have now um, exceeded evolution's uh, expectations of lifespan. And we're stuck with this, but we can't get rid of the things that evolution selected for because we need those things. We sure. need them to prevent cancer. We need them to optimize embryogenesis, you know, labor, et cetera, et cetera, and wound healing. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing very recently. Um, we and others have shown that senescent cells produce things that are important for tissue repair. Yep. So we have to be, we have to be very smart in how we intervene in these aging processes. And it doesn't mean it's impossible, um, but it does mean that we can't just, uh, it's not a simple solution. It's not going to be a simple senolytic and then, you know, we're all gonna live. Well, actually, the other thing is I should point out that um, most of our, most of what we know about senescence and aging comes from mouse models, not so much from, we, we do, I mean, many of us study human cells, we do, but in humans, we don't know yet. It, this hasn't been done in humans. Sure. Mice, we know, 
if you eliminate senescent cells throughout the lifespan, the mice are healthier. Jan van Versen, I think, did the classic experiment. With, there are two mouse models. We made one in, in the van Versen lab and with Jim Kirkland at the Mayo Clinic made the second mouse model. And in, in the van Versen model, the mice who had senescent cells eliminated throughout their lifespan lived healthier. Their median lifespan was extended but not their maximum lifespan. They still pretty much died on schedule. So the, the important lesson is don't confuse aging with death. Sure. And, um, and aging is malleable. It's not at all clear that species specific lifespan is malleable at this point in a complex organism. It's been done in C. elegans. It's been done in Drosophila, but you get to mice and really the extensions of maximum lifespan is just, you know, 10 to 20%. Um, sp speaking of complexity, I, I really uh, want to, um, to focus for a bit with you on um, the SASP and, and, you know, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. This has become a, a major component of your work, looking at um, what, these senescent cells ultimately secrete. And, you know, normally when we sort of read sort of the popular uh, press, say, and does a story about the SASP, they, you know, they usually put it in terms, well, there's the senescent cells and they secrete these bad things that hurt other tissue. Uh, but when I go to papers of yours, like this recent one, a proteomic atlas of senescent associated secretomes for aging biomarker development, and sort of, and I look at sort of what you're looking at nowadays, I mean, it, it, this is an amazing, list. Um, and just some of the things on this list, cytokines, growth factors, proteases, chemokines, DNA fragments, microRNAs, enzymes, other bioactive factors, and not just a few. Um, I, I used to work in the in the phytochemical business, and you know, uh, we used to blast apart uh, a plant, uh, do bioassay guided fractionation, and there were thousands of things that came out, and some were good, and some did nothing, and some were poisonous. Um, you, you put together the SAS Atlas at the buck. Uh, you have the SAS query tool now. Um, we're, talk generally about sort of where we are in terms of uh, understanding the good, the bad, and the ugly about SASP, and I know there's different types of SASP depending on cells. You have a core SASP when you when you analyze and overlap these different cell lineages. Um, take that one and run with it if you would uh, about sort of the landscape of SASP in 2021. Yeah, so I have to tell you, um, understanding the full spectrum of the SASP, and I, I will remind you that right now what we published, and I should just point out for the audience, it's on the Buck Institute website. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's freely available, so just click on the SASP Atlas and you'll see the whole list of, you know, as, as, as Ira said, hundreds of proteins that are being secreted by senescent human cells. So we do focus on human in this. And it was a surprise to us. It was really due to a fantastic collaboration we have with our mass spectrometry guru at the Buck, Birgit Schilling. And she and I have continued to collaborate to explore not mm -hmm. only the SAS of the kinds of human cells that are easy to grow in culture, but we're now moving to more exotic human cells that are not so easy to grow in culture, but which we can study when they become senescent. So hundreds of proteins and, and you know, what do you do with this list? Um, there were a couple of things that struck us when we first discovered this, and that was that this hundreds of proteins vary, that is the factors within that hundreds of proteins varied depending on how the cell became senescent. So we could do what Hayflick did, grow the cells, grow the cells until they stopped dividing, but we could also induce DNA damage, for example, with um, x-rays, or we could use a chemical for example, many chemotherapeutic agents we now understand induce senescence, not mm. only 
in the cancer cells, but in normal cells. And we could use those chemotherapies and induce senescence. Actually, now we're writing a paper now on how certain drugs that are used to treat patients with HIV AIDS yep. also can induce cells to become senescent. So when you look at those different inducers, the actual components of the secretory phenotype vary. Mm -hmm. And one of the big mysteries, there are actually several big, big mysteries in aging research, but one of the big mysteries in aging research is in a human, old human, we know there are more senescent cells than in a young human. That's been measured by many labs. How did they become senescent? What is driving them into senescent? These are normal people. They haven't received chemotherapy so far as we know. Um, but there's mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. There's um, other types of drugs we all take, the statins and whatever. Is it due to drugs? Is it due to mitochondrial dysfunction? Is it due to DNA damage? Is it due to telomeres? What is it due to? So the short answer is we don't know. But the longer answer is we're hopeful that by understanding the spectrum of proteins that are in the secretory phenotype, we might now be able to go back to old human tissue and say, aha, these cells became senescent due to this kind of insult that drove them into senescence. So we haven't got there yet, but that's one of the big pictures we're hoping to fill in. That is what drives senescence in vivo in humans during normal aging. The other, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Well, well the other, um, I, I think important thing about the senescent phenotype is the discovery that some of these things are good. So everybody, I think, understands that inflammation, chronic inflammation is bad, mm -hmm. right? Many, many years ago, decades ago, Claudio Franceschi in, in Italy uh, coined this term inflammaging. And it was used to describe the fact that if a pathologist took a little biopsy from a young liver, 15 year old liver and 50 year old liver, gave it blinded to a pathologist said who's young, who's old. Pathologists would almost certainly be able to tell immediately who's young, who's old. Why? It would look for low level inflammation. That is infiltration of immune cells that can be damaging. But I will remind you, you will never heal a wound ever if you don't have an initial inflammatory response. Yep. So again, evolution gave us inflammation because it helps get a wound healed quickly, which of course was important when the lion is chasing you out in the savannah, right? You want to be able to get up and heal those wounds quickly. But when it's chronic, which is what happens with age, and we know that senescent cells are a major driver of this so-called chronic inflammation. So the idea then became, um, what if we could find a way to selectively clear senescent cells from aged tissues? And that's become the basis of many, many companies now, many of them in the Bay Area here, sure. that are working on drugs that are trying to do that. And, and you know, that leads perfectly into my next talking point because, yeah, I mean, there's clearly been a major um, move the last several years, obviously, you, you with Unity as well, uh, probably probably leading company in this space in this analytics domain in terms of uh, ablating or, or getting rid of these cells entirely. Um, there are some um, more embryonic, let's say, initiatives in what we'll term either senomodulation, whereby uh, we could develop drugs to uh, maybe interfere with some of the parts of the bad parts of this asp or enhance the good parts of this asp. And then this other class we will term xenomorphic, uh, you know, uh, could we epigenetically change a cell that is senescent if it's not too damaged back to something healthier. Um, as you learn about 
these unique SASPs and, and, and what's going on here. Um, how has that sort of changed? Because obviously, if you, as you were pointing out, if you have a, a genotoxic substance that is making cells, a chemotherapy, whatever, yeah, you probably want those cells out of there. But if it's like, uh, you know, you published this re very recent review, the metabolic roots of senescence, uh, if it's uh, hyperglycemia that's causing it, maybe you don't want to eliminate all the cells. Maybe you want to modulate inflammation there with the, with the senomodulator. Um, how, how is your view, and I, I, obviously I know you're on the board of Unity, but uh, how has your view sort of changed as time's gone by with regard to uh, sort of the broader seno therapeutic space and what, wh where we should be going with it uh, in the coming years? You know, it's a great question. And I should point out, I'm not on the board of Unity. So Unity was um, established, actually, I didn't start Unity. Unity was started by Ned David. No, I'll let you start it. It's fine. <laughs> um, uh, venture capitalist. Sure. He started it at the Buck in my lab, and the Buck was great, sure. and it hosted and this company. So now, uh, you know, I follow them. Of course, I, I own stock and I care about them. But they're one of now, really, dozens and dozens of companies that are working on the same same idea. So there's good news and bad news. I mean, this is like life, right? This sure. Is bad news. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is uh, certainly in mouse models and even in certain human tissues that are taken ex vivo and put into culture but treated for short periods of time with senolytics, there are benefits no question that it's getting rid of senescent cells in a mouse and those mice are genetically engineered to develop a whole host of age-related diseases mm -hmm. from alzheimer's and parkinson's disease to osteoarthritis osteoporosis macular degeneration etc 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 so we know that eliminating senescent cells can be beneficial in those mouse models Mice are not humans, and you know, we, among others, are very aware of that. So the question then is, can this be translated to humans? The beauty of senolytics, as far as I feel, and this is just my feeling, is that you don't need to have the drug present all the time. So if you follow the appearance of senescent cells with age, it's slow and it's gradual which means that you can kill off senescent cells and then take away the drug and wait. In a human, we don't know how long to wait, but in a mouse, it can be months before the cells pile up again. And that's good. Drug companies don't like that, but it's good because it means you don't have constant pressure from the drug. Whereas the senomorphic drugs you need constant pressure from the drug. We've used them and they work. You know, you add the drug, the cells stop secreting, especially they, a lot of them are designed to stop secreting those pro-inflammatory things. Great. Take away the drug, the cells are still there. They'll start secreting again. So, you know, there are several approaches that are being considered by, by biotech. Um, some are, can we modify a senescent cell so that it, with a senomorphic, for example, it permanently stops secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines. So now it can still secrete those things that are needed, say for wound healing. So we published a paper years ago showing that senescent cells secrete a growth factor that's required for skin wound healing. Mm -hmm. And that growth factor is, is understudied. It's not being studied by the wound healing community very much, but you would like to preserve that part of the SAS and get rid of the ones that cause this damage and inflammation. So we are not there yet at all, but this is where the research is heading is try to make these things more specific and more able to be tolerated. Um, I will also point out that um, you certainly don't want to take a senolytic before you have major surgery. And you certainly don't want to take a senolytic if you're pregnant. You know, so there are constraints to, to all of these drugs. But that's true for every drug. I mean, sure. even 
as you know, even now baby aspirin is being given a bad name. So yeah. So, yeah. Um, Sennet, um, uh, talked, yeah. talked about it a bit with uh, Dr. Verdan uh, last week. National Institutes of Health, Common Fund, $125 million uh, dedicated. You must be very excited that the NIH is thinking about senescence. Um, you and Dr. Schilling were just awarded a, I think a $12.7 million grant out of the NIH Common Fund. Uh, talk a little bit about what SendNet's all about. I know there's something like 16 different labs that are going to be working all together, but uh, this is very exciting times, I guess. Yes, it is. So there are two parts to SendNet. There is the part that is designed to literally map senescent cells across the lifespan with an emphasis on humans. So the emphasis, there will, there are some very limited mouse studies, a little bit more limited uh, cell culture studies with human cells, but the main thing is to acquire human tissue from humans and really try to understand how this plays out in the human lifespan. So it's a wonderful initiative, something that frankly, no one lab could do by itself. And this is what is so exciting is that there are six labs that have been awarded um, what's called the U54. This is the uh, broad spectrum uh, ability to map senescent cells in certain human tissues across the lifespan and also across different diseases. So at the Buck, we're focusing on three tissues and we're very excited about this because one of them is very understudied. So first, let me tell you about the ones that are more well studied, but still we don't know much about. And so the first one is skeletal muscle. This mm -hmm. is a very unusual tissue. So a muscle fiber is actually a whole bunch of cells that have fused together. They're not individual cells. So how do you decide whether one of those cells that compose this big fiber is senescent or not? And of course, one of the ways we'll do this is by looking at nuclei, looking at the nucleus of those mm -hmm. muscle fibers. And this, the head of that, initiative, which will also involve developing new technologies, is Simon Meloff at the Buck Institute. So this is really three PIs that have come together to drive this initiative. And then probably a dozen other PIs, some from the Buck, some from outside the Buck, that have joined the effort. So skeletal muscle. Um, there are some muscles in your body that show signs of aging, no matter how much you exercise, signs are there. There are other muscles that don't show too much signs of aging. There are yet other muscles that show signs of aging. And if you exercise, they're in much better shape. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have to figure this out. You know, what is it about those different types of muscles? The second tissue that we're studying is human breast. So this, of course, um, is a uh, based on the fact that we now know that breast cancer, which is probably one of the most common cancers in females, but also has gone from being almost a death sentence. Certainly when I was a young child, I remember my mom crying because her best friend had breast cancer. She was going to die and she did die. Um, but it's now a, a, a mostly manageable disease if it's caught early. And we have, so Chris Benz at the Buck Institute, who is an oncologist and works on the breast and breast cancer. And we've collaborated with him. We have a long history of, of uh, inquiry into breast cancer. It's not just the breast cancer cells. It's the cells around the cancer the so-called stroma, but also the fat. Mm -hmm. Breast has a lot of fat. And fat cells we've always known are a rich source of senescent cells. So we'll be focusing also on breast. And then the last tissue is something which we traditionally at the Buck has had no experience, but a couple of years ago, we acquired a 
part-time adjunct faculty of uh, Francesca Duncan from Northwestern University who established a lab at the Buck and she works on the ovary. Okay. And the ovary is the first tissue to age. So, you know, this whole idea of looking at somatic tissues that is non-reproductive tissues and a reproductive tissue like the ovary is extremely exciting. So everyone at the Buck is exciting because we're all going to be contributing to understanding how senescence appears in these tissues and then eventually what role they play. I will point out SenNet was not designed to develop therapies. It was designed to gather information. It, the whole idea is to put forth to the entire community, all of our data is going to be made public as quickly as possible. And SenNet has put into place other labs that specialize in um, organizing data, using artificial intelligence to analyze data, and then putting it out so that all scientists and all non-scientists will have access to that data. So it's a fantastic initiative. And, you know, I, I mean, more than just us, all of those other labs are just thrilled. And there's a requirement. The requirement is that all of the labs that participate is we not only talk to each other, we work with each other. So different labs are focusing on different tissues, liver, skin, the eye, and we're all going to be learning from each other. So it's, it's really exciting. And we just had our very first big two-day meeting, unfortunately, by Zoom, but we hope the next one will be in person. And um, we will be exchanging data left and right. So it's extremely exciting. You know, it's 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 a very exciting. It's fascinating uh, thinking about all the um, the programs that that are coming out of that. And I had Jennifer Garrison on a couple of weeks ago talking about the the reproductive uh, uh, longevity initiatives at the Buck as well. Um, you were mentioning the breast um, work, though. It got me thinking because um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the intro, um, I've sort of. You know, back in the, the late 1980s, when you first hooked up with um, Mina Bissell um, and were working on breast cancer work at the time, um, you know, I, there's articles, it's, it's a conversation here in downtown Philadelphia, and, and Mina Bissell, in, in, in even older articles, talks about her work or her inspiration from, from another local luminary down the road here, uh, Beatrice Mintz. Uh, who I think at 100 years old is still occasionally yeah. <laughs> visits Fox Chase. Um, just looping back to that for a moment, because as you know, um, a lot of that work has to do with, as you were mentioning, this, this grander microenvironment uh, and, and cancer. You know, cells important, microenvironment doing something else, uh, whether that's biologic, whether it's biophysical and all these unique uh, forces and, and shear stresses and everything that goes on, not just in breast tissue, but elsewhere. Um, have you come across any interesting biophysical um, findings, let's say, in your senescence work? I mean, you've talked about genotoxic drugs will do this, and you've talked about uh, this, you know, you broadly looked at metabol um, metabolic roots of senescence. Any interesting biophysical findings that uh, you might not be working on, but are like, wow, yeah, that's, I'm going to keep that here for later, uh, thinking back to the, the bissell mintz uh, connections. Yeah, yeah so, so Mina's, uh, I think, a big contribution was to show that oncogenes are usually not sufficient. Yeah. You need two things. You, need the onco you do need the oncogenes, but you also need a, a tissue environment that's permissive for those oncogenes to develop into a cancer. Um, so speaking of biophysical, we have now started a collaboration with uh, Tamara Alliston at UCSF, who's very okay. interested in stiffness, tissue mm. stiffness. And Dan Weiner, who is a faculty member at the Buck, has had a long-standing interest in how tissue stiffness might regulate what a cell will experience within that tissue. And I will remind you, one of the things that happens with age is a process called fibrosis. Sure. 
And what fibrosis does is it makes things stiffer. So sometimes it's very obvious, like in the lung, when you have fibrosis, you have a bit bad disease. And I mean, there are even genetic models where people die because of fibrosis that develops in the lung. Mm -hmm. But most tissues become slightly or sometimes severely fibrotic with age. And that changes the stiffness of the tissue microenvironment. And we're now uh, beginning to study how a cell in a stiff versus non-stiff environment might undergo senescence and how that might modulate what they secrete. So these are very exciting early times. So we're not even funded for this yet. We're still kind of feeling our way around this. But the idea is to try to understand how biophysical um, manifestations of a tissue could, could de determine what a cell is, is expressing and then in a senescent cell secreting. Excellent, excellent, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, I mean, I honestly think of the local work uh, at Fox Chase, but then folks like Mike Levin from Tufts, who I had on the show, you know, who works in the sort of the bioelectric domain and, you know, trying yeah. to get the, the drugs out of the way. Can we zap or do whatever we need to do? To, it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting few years coming up, uh, no doubt. Um, Judy, one other thing I wanted to ask about, um, you know, another topic I talked with with Eric uh, about last week was this rejuvenome project that that was recently um, started at the Buck, where among other things, um, they're going to be looking at at combinations. And you know, this is you know, as I I spent most of my career in the pharmaceutical industry, and that was sort of one of the things back in the day that uh, everyone wanted to do, but you could never do it because the FDA, you know, never had a way to do it. Uh, now there are uh, guidances, FDA, EMAA, and so forth, uh, that sort of lay out, you know, if you want to study drug A, B, and C early and not wait for A, B, and C to be on the market for 15 years before you study them together, other ways of doing that. And I think that that's sort of one of the interesting things that this Rejuvenome project will be doing. Uh, but coming back specifically to you, um, as you sit around, not sit around, but as you spend your time thinking about senolytics and senomorphics and senomodulation and, and biophysics and metabolism and everything that comes together, um, what do you think about combinations? I mean, do you daydream about uh, uh, senolytics combined with cross-link modulators and yes. anti-inflammatories? Well, what are some of the exciting uh, possibilities that if you had a trillion dollars tomorrow that you would uh, run in many directions with in terms of combinations? Yeah, so I think senolytics are exciting. I think that they probably will need to be used in combination because it's senescent cells also um, can cause changes in tissues that are not going to be reversed if you get rid of the senescent cell. And this is where you might need another drug, for example, a cross-link breaker. Because once you make those cross-links, senescent cell can die, but that cross-link is there. And that's causing stiffness, which is going to then influence other cells that are nearby and change the whole tissue microenvironment. So I think the idea of combinations is actually um, a very future wave of the wave that's that we're going to actually see in our lifetime, hopefully in our lifetime. Um, but what I will also say is I'm also a big fan of what I would call intermittent dosing. Okay. So far as I know, there are no drugs that have zero side effects if you take them constantly. Every drug has some kind of side effect. And sometimes the side effects are mild and it's well worth the good things that they do. Statins for many people, for example, but not for all people. And so that is a wave of the future, I think, is to be able to think about drugs not being taken constantly. Drug companies in general don't like that. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> but it, it may be what we have to do to be intelligent about how to postpone aging phenotypes. And then the last thing to remember is that, um, again, as I pointed out earlier, we do not know 
what evolution has done to set species specific lifespan. Mm -hmm. We don't know why a mouse lives three years and a human lives a hundred years. We don't know. Both genomes have been sequenced. It can't be as simple as, you know, mining those genomes and figuring out what makes the difference. Yeah. So this is a wave of the future too, that I think, you know, if we really want to think about lifespan extension, we have a long, long way to go. Well, I'm glad there is the Dr. Judy Kim pieces of the world working on the problem. And uh, you clearly have um, quite a, a fascinating portfolio uh, in front of you. Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting next few years, no doubt, uh, for you and your lab. Um, Judy, any, anything that I missed? I know we talked about uh, several areas of, of your laboratory's research, future programs. What's coming up in early 2022 that you can mention now? Conferences you're going to be at, talks you're going to be giving. Please take the floor. So, uh, so, so, of course, SendNet will be meeting, you know, regularly. Um, the idea is that right now the first meeting was closed to the people who were the PI, the um, principal investigators who were funded, but it's going to be open to our labs now. So it, this will be decimated. But there are, I mean, for example, there is an international cell senescence association um, that has yearly meetings and they are going to be, I mean, they hold yearly meetings, but they also have a website. I would urge everybody, it's I, uh, ICSA, International Cell Senescence Association, um, and look at, they, they host webinars, they, they cover the whole spectrum of, of cell senescence, but the focus is on how senescent cells contribute to aging. Mm -hmm. And then there are things like the Age Association, um, the American Association for the Met American Federation for Aging Research, all of them host public events that are easily available. Just Google, Google aging events and, 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 and they're all there to, to educate the public. The only, the last thing I, I will um, point out though, is that it, it is still, I think, really important to distinguish aging from death. And this is something I don't think all of Silicon Valley has quite grasped, <laughs> but they are different. And so I think in our lifetime, yours and mine, Ira, but also probably most of the people who would be listening to this uh, podcast, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to die. Yeah. Good scientist. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to bet against that. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> Exactly. Um, you know, I would never say th this is impossible, but right now I think we're, we're stuck with death. <clears throat> the question is, how do we die? And I, I think you probably have heard me refer to this comment by Thurgood Marshall. Um, who, so Thurgood, for those of your audience who may not remember, Thurgood Marshall was the first Black Supreme Court Justice mm -hmm. in the United States. It's a lifetime appointment. This was in the 1960s. And someone asked him, how long do you plan to live? And his response, I just love it because it's sort of what we want. So he said, I, I plan to die at 110 mm. from a bullet wound. Well, this is America, of course. So <laughs> from a bullet wound from a jealous husband. Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe... Maybe we can all look forward to that. <laughs> oh boy! Well, it, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting time, and um, yeah. you know, it's 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 really been fascinating um, going through this journey with you, Judy, and and and, uh, and looking at the full history of, of everything that you've been up to. Um, for everybody that is going to be listening to this episode. Uh, on our podcast or watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Judith Campisi, Professor of Biogerontology, Buck Institute for Research on Aging. Uh, definitely go check out the uh, SASP Atlas, the SASP Query Tool. Uh, check out SendNet, the International uh, Cellular Senescence Association. Uh, 
check out her several hundred publications in PubMed if you're interested in diving deeper into the topic. But Judy, it was, it was great seeing you. I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Thanks for everything you've been doing and continue to do. And as we say on this show, thank you for creating the better tomorrow for all of us for your work. Really very impressive and inspiring. And you are what you're doing. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Thanks for that. Great seeing you. Yes.